help, saying, God of the midges, you are good to us. Meanwhile, in Kenneth McKellar's comic song Midges, he suggests that since God was always a bloke for a practical joke, he made Scotland the home of the midges. The Bible has sage things to say about our smallest creaturely companions, which sounds a bit more sympathetic. Proverbs tells us, go to the ant, you lazy bones, consider its ways and be wise. Proverbs also praises creatures, including locusts, that are small, but exceedingly wise. Perhaps there is something profound in all this. We often think of human beings as separate from or superior in some way to the ecosystem around us, but we are part of the natural world, not beings that are radically separate from it. Proverbs suggest that it's not just human beings that need to thrive. And by presenting us with the perspective of our enemy, the midge, Edwin Morgan's poem generates empathy in comical form with the creatures surrounding us and what they need. Morgan lets us see that midges are more like us than unlike us, even if they're creatures of horror. So perhaps the Scottish midge forecast is a timely reminder that they are part of our fragile but precious natural ecosystem just as we are. We're all connected. Having said that, I'll still be avoiding camping in the next few weeks. Oh, Lyndon, two weeks today, I'm heading up the West Coast. This <laughs> With your tent. very close to my heart. With your tent and a boot full of midget repellent, if yes. you've any sense. And the midge net. <laughs> Don't forget the midge net. Now, we're talking about last night's game, of course, throughout the programme this morning because there was a huge delay. Uh, rain fell uh, in, quite, uh, in quite dramatic style. Uh, we've already heard from Joy, our weather forecast this morning, almost uh, 20 millilitres of rain in uh, a very short space of time, in about an hour before the match kicked off. It led to the match being stopped and then restarted, although the restart took quite some time. Indeed, we'd love to hear from you if you were at the match or trying to get to the match or trying to get home from the match. Um, my favourite quote of the day, though, was from Steve Clark, who said afterwards, apart from the birth of my three children, I think it was the longest day of my life. Um, yeah, and I think a lot of <laughs> fans would have felt the same way. Phil is here. Uh, interestingly, when the match did resume, history was made, but there was an element of force to it all too. I mean, where do we start? It, it resembled something like a goon sketch last night at Hamden. We had biblical rain, numerous pitch inspections, kids with squeegees taking the adulation of the crowd, and then Georgians delaying the reappearance onto the pitch, seemingly trying to, to have the game called off. Nearly two hours later, though, the game resumed at 9.35, and the wait, I think you'll agree, was worth it. But it might break Tom in his way. It does! Nil Scotland beating Georgia at the National Stadium last night. Eight points this morning. They sit clear of Group A as we reach the halfway point in qualifying. It's the first time ever Scotland have started a qualifying campaign with four straight wins. A memorable night for all sorts of reasons then. Sports writer John Grecian, both as a fan and in a professional capacity, was at Hamden. He was doing the tactics zone for the Daily Record. John, morning to you. There wasn't much tactics zone to be spoken about in the first couple of hours. No, I'm very glad that I'm not actually doing that today. <laughs> I got a day off. Um, it was a what a you used the word farce. I mean, as a game, it was not a classic, but it was definitely an epic, like one of those Lord of Rings director's cut things. Have you seen anything like this before in your forty years as a as a man and boy fallen Scotland? Not really. I remember some very wet games. We had a friendly in Portugal where it was really soaked. And I think if it, was a, if it wasn't a friendly, you know, if it had been a competitive game, they might have called it off. Uh, when the Georgians were refusing to come out, um, my mind flashed back to one team in Tallinn when Scotland, of course, and Estonia took the field in October 96 and the Estonians refused to play. Uh, so I was glad that the game just actually got going again. Yeah. I mean, there is a serious point to all this, John, which is that the, the player's safety is paramount. And, and that's what the Georgians would have been, been arguing about last night. Um, I mean, the game restarted after two hours of delay, but there was touch and go whether that actually the game was going to take place. Yeah, I think all round where we were sitting in, in the stand, I was there with my, my son and my dad and there were three generations there were all looking at each other in that first five, six minutes saying, how can this game possibly carry on? It, there were laughs, but there was nervous laughter in the crowd, like somebody's going to get hurt or it's going to be an absolute crazy goal where the ball stops. 
stops a bit like your line, I'm afraid, John. I think the water oh, has maybe got into it. No, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not your fault. It's technology. Listen, we'll, we'll, we'll persevere with this final question to you. Um, there's four games left. Scotland are eight points clear at the top of Group A. Are you going to be the first person in Scottish sport journalism to call it this morning that we're going to qualify for Germany next summer? Only if I don't get a nasty phone call from Steve Clark. <laughs> I think he wants to play it down a little bit. But yeah, look, it's one more win and we're there, I would think. Yeah, I think Steve Clark. Fifteen points will get you there. I think Steve Clark might struggle to get a hold of you this morning, John, with the with the line. Listen, we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Not least because it was a very, very, very late finish uh, for you last night. There's John Grishin, their sports writer, forty years a fan, as well as a writer on Scottish football. The first time that three generations of the Grishins went to Hamden last night. One he'll probably remember for a very long time. And um, he mentioned Steve Clark there. Uh, our intrepid reporter Jane. Lewis earned her money last night, keeping us all up to date with what was happening on the pitch when there was no action uh, on it. Um, afterwards, she asked Steve Clark, given that we've won four qualifiers in a row for the very first time at a campaign, are we almost there in fa as far as qualifying is concerned? Yeah, we've done all right. <laughs> we've done all right. No, no, listen, good, good, good start, really good start. I said six points wouldn't qualify us. I don't think 12 will qualify us, but we're a hell of a lot closer to the points tally that will qualify us. I like that. It's a good start. It's almost as understated as you saying it rained last night at the <laughs> <laughs> um, Before I go, we, we'll have plenty more. Um, obviously, we'll actually check in with Jane Lewis a little later as well because actually last night she was running between the, the pitch and the broadcast point, keeping us all updated as to what was the happening. There were some scenes that was taking place behind closed doors with the George and saying, look, we're just not coming out. This is just not safe. She dried out yet? Uh, well, let's ask her. First question before I go, Andy Murray. He says there's no need to overreact after losing in the opening round of Queen's straight sets defeat to the number seven seed Alex de Manure. Uh, we're staying hopeful for Wimbledon. Phil, thank you very much. You're listening to Good Morning Scotland. Time now, half past seven. On digital radio. FM. Your smart speaker. And online. BBC Radio Scotland. Time for this morning's news and sport for the borders with Angela Suave. Good morning. A Gartenside man will go on trial in August, accused of disrupting three Duke of Buccleuch hunts on land near Hoyk. Appearing at Jedburgh Sheriff Court, John McNeil pleaded not guilty to trespassing on land at Cotfield Farm last October, where it said a lawful vermin control operation was being carried out. 66-year-old McNeil also denied, with another person, deliberately calling the Duke of Buccleuch's hounds onto a road at Aylmoor Farm a week earlier, allegedly endangering them and and road users and to obstructing another hunt in November by trespassing on private land at Borthwick Shales. The border's newest school has been given a glowing first inspection report. Education Scotland and the Care Inspectorate visited the Jedburgh Grammar campus during the spring. Yesterday they published their findings. David Knox reports. When Jedburgh Grammar Campus opened its doors for the first time in August 2020, it became the region's only education facility where children would be taught under one roof from nursery age all the way through to secondary sixth year. Although the campus's first couple of years were hampered by lockdowns and concerns over its open plan classroom design, inspectors from Education Scotland and the Care Inspectorate have returned a glowing report. They highly commend Susan Oliver's headship, as well as the teamwork of her deputies beneath her, to create what they describe as a new purposeful learning community. The 860 pupils from early years through to secondary benefit from an aspirational ethos which is underpinned by well-embedded values and positive relationships. Well, Mrs Oliver and her team have been given a few areas for improvement though regarding consistency of learning, giving pupils more of a voice and further developing the nursery curriculum. Talking of inspections, the Hoyk care homes again improved two years after being rated weak by inspectors. The Buchlu and St Margaret's Care Centre was rated adequate when the care inspectorate team returned last November. But an unannounced visit last month saw them judged good in five categories, including leadership, staff, the quality of care and support planned. There were two more employees, one to help with mealtimes, and the inspectors mentioned the warmth, kindness and compassion between residents and staff.
This year's Borders Book Festival has broken records. Over the four days, total attendances at Harmony Gardens approached 40,000, up by almost a quarter on last year, and nearly a third of the sessions were sold out. Ticket and book sales were up 13% too. Organisers admit the sunny weather in Melrose played its part, along with the usual packed programme. They say it proves both appetite and confidence has returned at long last post-Covid. Over 100 people took part in a charity walk at the weekend to remember former Kelso rugby player Clive Miller. And more than £11,000 has been raised so far from the walk from Myerside in Edinburgh to Pointer Park. It was organised by former Kelso and Scotland international Eric Paxton in memory of his former teammate. It's been an amazing effort to ever that's been involved. The, the, the walkers, we had 100 odd walkers, which is just amazing. The backup crew... Uh, my friends, Colin Dammit, Scott Forbes, helped to organise it all. It's been a, an amazing effort, but he was, he was an amazing man. He was a sportsman, he was an athlete, he had some injury in him. People came to him because his, his work ethic was tremendous. He was at Watsonians, he was here, and he was lucky enough to win championships when he was here. But he was just an amazing fluke and just went too quick. Spring COVID boosters are on offer for those who are eligible at two local drop-in clinics this week. The team is at Kelso Showground today and then at Duns Volunteer Hall on Friday. Jags are for anyone 75 or over by the end of this month, for care home residents and for people aged 5 or over who have a weakened immune system. The owners of a Selkirk Tortoise are stepping up security after their 60-year-old reptile's latest bid for freedom saw so make it to the other end of town. Tommy, who's known to have done a runner on two previous occasions, disappeared from his garden pen on Hillside Terrace last weekend. He was found 36 hours later in the grounds of a nursing home in the Bannerfield, more than two kilometres away. Owner Catherine Scott believes Tommy the Tortoise may have had a helping hand. I think that he's probably managed to make his own way down to uh, Mungo Park sort of area because our garden comes out at the by Mungo Park. Um, and then I think he's perhaps been helped on his way a little bit um, and then dumped somewhere. So um, I don't think it's likely that he's managed to cross the A7 and bridges and things without without some kind of mishap. Mungo Park, the Explorer, how appropriate. In racing, inform form Hoyt jockey Jason Hart finished runner-up at Royal Ascot yesterday aboard Sprint Queen Highfield Princess in the Group 1 Kings Stand Stakes. And their speedway tonight, Berwick Bandits taking on Birmingham Brummies. Rory Schlein returns for Berwick after back problems. But out the borders with her, here's Joy Dunlop. Good morning. A mainly dry and bright start, but showers will soon start to develop throughout this morning, although those showers should ease midway through this afternoon, with cloud becoming more widespread by this evening. Westerly winds becoming brisk today, with highs reaching 18 to 21 Celsius, so still feeling warm in the sun. Cloud will then linger for a time this evening, although it should gradually clear throughout the night, with a few patches of mist and fog forming in sheltered areas as winds fall light, lows of 7 to 10 Celsius. BBC Radio Scotland forecast for the border. Get the latest news on your smart speaker whenever you want. Just say, play BBC News for Scotland. You're listening to Good Morning Scotland with Laura Maxwell and Gary Robertson. 24 minutes to 8. And in the last half hour or so, we've had the latest indicator of the cost of living pressures that we're all facing. Consumer price inflation ran at 8.7%. That's unchanged from the previous month. Experts had been predicting it might have fallen slightly, but prices are continuing to run at historic highs. Our business and economy editor is Douglas Fraser and is here to talk us through all of this. Morning to you, Douglas. Good morning, Gary. Uh, let's just talk about what we mean by inflation and the fact that this figure hasn't moved. Well, it's the rate at which prices have risen over 12 months. In today's case, it's the 12 months to May. Now, you can measure inflation at any price, uh, and indeed, it, it can be deflation if the prices fall, but that's not a problem at the moment. So you can get wage inflation, oil price inflation, inflation in the prices of inputs or outputs uh, for industry. But the one that interests us is consumer price inflation, one of several measures from the Office for National Statistics, which covers a range of around 700 items that can be in the shopping basket for a typical household, weighted by the likelihood that they're in that basket. And not just goods, but lots of services too, the cost of household bills such as energy, which of course put a rocket under inflation from uh, nearly two years ago that started. So as this measures inflation over the past year, and last year prices were already up a lot, then you would hope the compassion...
comparison would show inflation falling, even if prices are not falling, uh, but that's not what we're seeing in today's figures. No, indeed. It, it stayed the same as last month, as the previous month. Yeah, the index for consumer price inflation, that's, as I say, the one we tend to focus on, has not changed since uh, the figure for the 12 months to April. It came down last month, uh, that figure, from more than 10%, which had been for more than six months, to 8.7% growth in prices across the 12 months. That's not changed in the in the year to May. Why is that? Well, the Office for National Statistics says it's to do with uh, air travel, recreation and culture, second-hand cars. If you look a bit closer, it's the cost of going to a live concert. Now, Sweden recently they said inflation there was boosted by one Beyonce concert and we may be seeing the Beyonce, Elton John, Harry Styles Bruce Springsteen effect here as well also computer games and package holidays, if you're still buying CDs the price of them was rising last year but falling this year, uh, the price of petrol and diesel is down the price of the average uh, litre of petrol last month was pound forty-four, down from pound sixty-seven, if you remember in May last year and that's kept inflation from rising uh, again there but prices for food and soft drinks are up. There's also a measure of core inflation, which include, excludes the volatile bits like energy and food and drink. And, and that's carefully watched by the central bank. That inflation rate has risen from 6.8% to 7.1%. That's the highest rate for 30 years. Uh, yeah, and a lot of people will be focused particularly on food prices because, of course, they've been high for quite some time now. Yeah, we have been particularly concerned with energy. Well, the price of that is uh, falling a, a bit, and we should see the effect of uh, um, from July of prices coming down for household energy. But the problem uh, with food is not just high prices, but rising prices making them higher still. And that problem has eased only very slightly. It's certainly not gone away. Last month for the year to April, food price inflation was at 19.1%, the highest for 45 years. That's fallen in the year to May to 18.1%. Not much of a reassurance there that the pressure is coming off, but at least it's a small step in the right direction. Uh, as I say, remember that's not a fall in prices, but a fall at the rate uh, at which prices are increasing. Milk, cheese, eggs, they've been among the biggest risers in price in recent months. That increasing rate has eased a bit. And fish prices were uh, rising last month from 14% inflation to nearly 17% uh, over the past year. Not such good news for UK fishing crews, I'm afraid. And that was mainly due to canned tuna. And a lot of concern, Douglas, about the price that people are paying for mortgages if they're having to uh, uh, renegotiate their mortgage. And tomorrow we get an announcement about interest rates and uh, th these rising interest rates are meant to combat inflation. Oh, yeah, and this applies to people borrowing for all sorts of reasons, including businesses that have to do so. The Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England is meeting today, and tomorrow they'll announce what they'll do with interest rates. Uh, their last 12 meetings have led to an announcement the rate was going up. Uh, 18 months ago, it was at uh, a tenth of 1%. Well, uh, the most recent meeting was 4.5%. And now there's a very strong expectation it's going to rise again. Today's figure will make that expectation stronger still. It's today's inflation figure, that is. The, the worry of the, the central bank economists in trying to bear down on in inflation, uh, which is their core job, is that it, it isn't uh, subsiding as fast as expected and hoped. And in particular, that core inflation is a worry. And so is the balance of, of the cost of services going up, even when the cost of goods inflation is falling a bit. These are indicators that inflation's not so much being imported from overseas as it was, from global prices and imports, but it's being fueled by wage inflation and price inflation from companies here. And the point of using interest rates is, is to make the cost of finance higher, reducing the amount of money available for demand, for buying stuff, for investing. And with less demand in the economy, price increases should ease off, but they're not doing so as expected or as fast as expected. So more interest rates uh, rises are, are pretty much certain. Indeed, they're expected not just tomorrow, but at the meeting after that in, in August. The, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, said yesterday he's not going to help those facing much higher mortgage bills. Many of them, when they come to refinance past fixed rate deals, finding much, much higher monthly bills. It would, of course, be very expensive for the government to step in and do that and help people with rising bills, but it would also counteract the, what the Bank of England's trying to do. The whole point of rising interest rates is to cause a squeeze on budgets for households and businesses, and the uncomfortable fact is that it hasn't yet squeezed enough to have that intended effect. OK, Douglas, thank you very much for that update. Our business and economy editor, Douglas Fraser, there. 18 minutes to 8 now, and disrupted ferries, reduced timetables and cancelled crossings have left residents on Scotland's islands feeling frustrated.
Calmac's chief executive has already apologised to the residents of South Uist after their main ferry route to the mainland was cancelled for the whole month of June. And last night, Robbie Drummond faced locals once again at a public meeting in Dalabra. He joins us now. Good morning to you, Mr Drummond. Um, your, your second meeting with locals in as many weeks. Are you much further forward in fixing their problem? Well, good, good morning. And, um, you know, the, the, the level of support that uh, the community turned out yesterday just shows the depth of feeling, the anger they're feeling about their services. Um, and it's difficult for us to listen to some of those personal stories. But we have given the commitment that services will resume in full to Loch Boyko from the, the 1st of July. Uh, and we have put other mitigations in place to that period with sailings across the Sainte Barra and also additional sailings from Loch Maddy. Um, we heard from uh, Christina Morrison, who has been at both the meetings over the last couple of weeks. She felt that she didn't really get any real answer. She said you, you, you gave her a guarantee, but almost, but but an almost guarantee about about the sailings uh, getting underway again in July, because it all depends on whether the Finlagen, which services Isla, is fixed. Well, that, that's correct. And the challenge we have now is that two of our major vessels are out of service from our fleet of 11. Um, and when we face with those uh, difficulties, it means we need to share our services across our, our whole network. But we're absolutely confident that the Finlagen will return. Uh, everything is on track. Uh, and therefore, full sailings can resume to Loch Boysdale from the 1st of July. And I'm pleased that those sailings are now available in our system to be booked by customers right through to October. Um, we heard that there was quite a lot of frustration last night, especially in terms of, of this this idea of we hear, we keep hearing about the matrix, this this dis with the method, the algorithms which is used to describe uh, to decide how the ferries are deployed. Deployed. Are you going to change the matrix? Yeah, what we've said to communities is, well, first of all, the matrix is a, it's just a simple tool that helps us make a decision as to how we can best balance our services right across. Um, our whole network to make sure we maintain a lifeline service or access to a lifeline service to all communities. It is just a simple tool that helps us make those decisions. And Except it doesn't work in this situation because they haven't had their impact. lifeline ser service. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, these are incredible difficult decisions that, that we have to make and the impact is is challenging on our, on our communities. But what we have said is we will talk to um, and engage our communities and look at how that matrix could perhaps be changed in the future and place a different uh, weighting on some of those different elements. It, it looks at uh, frequency of services, number of people disrupted, whether there's alternative uh, sailings uh, and how frequent the sailings are. But perhaps there's a different way we look at that. And we're obviously committed to talking to uh, all communities and, and refreshing how that works into the future. When will that happen? Uh, it's already started. So we've started the communication process uh, last week and we're just planning how we go and talk to all the island communities over the next uh, number of weeks. Um, we've heard this week from uh, people on Mull and Iona. They've written to the Scottish Government. They're looking for what, one and a half million pounds worth of compensation over what they call um, CalMAC's failing ferry service. Are you running a failing service? Um, we are running a service that um, tries to deliver the best we can uh, given the assets that are available to us. Uh, everyone at Kamak is absolutely committed to providing the best service we can. You know, I'm enormously sympathetic to people who are being disrupted, and it was difficult for us to listen to some of those stories. Uh, we do offer full passenger rights to passengers who, who are impacted, um, but uh, questions around conversations for businesses is really one for Transport Scotland. You say you run the best service you can with the resources that you have. Um, we know that the Glen Sanex and Hull 802 currently in uh, dock in Port Glasgow are over budget and late. The Scottish Government's study last month said that it, it wasn't value for money to, to finish the second vessel, Hull 802. Would you rather that they, they scrapped it? and actually bought a ferry somewhere else that would arrive quicker and perhaps be cheaper in the, in the long run? Well, what I'm pleased about is that um, the Scottish Government um, has provided those resources so that we now have six major vessels on order, the two from the, from the Clyde, but also four major vessels being ordered from Turkey. And those six new large vessels, and also 10 smaller vessels on plan, 
will make a huge difference to our resilience uh, and enable us to offer a much better service to the communities. And I think that's really to be welcomed. But I suppose there is an argument to be made that you might be able to get that resilience in, on to, into the system quicker if they abandoned Hull 802 and went out elsewhere. Um, but those, those decisions are early ones for um, for, for uh, CMAL who order the vessels. Yeah, but, but you're I mean, running the service with the depleted service. So what I'm trying to say is, do you have discussions with CMAL about the way that they are they're ordering vessels? Because you're the one running the service. You're the one having to face local people. Yes, we, we have regular discussions with, with CMAL and Transport Scotland. We welcome the investment that's being made. And are we they really listening to you? Those vessels coming in place. Are, do they listen to you though in, the, in those those meetings? Uh, of course, they listen. We work in a very collaborative way with with CML and Transport Scotland, and all all the bodies involved just simply want to provide the best service available. I think we recognise that investment has been slow in coming forward, um, but is now being put in place and will deliver a much better um, service uh, right into the future. Uh, Robbie Drummond from CalMac, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. And Stephen is asking on the phone-in, should islanders be compensated for ferry disruption? The lines will open at 8 o'clock on 0808 92 00, or you can text 80295. And this time next week, next Wednesday, Good Morning Scotland live from the Western Isles as we take stock of the disruption that islanders are facing. The time now is 11 minutes to 8. This morning's news headlines. The UK inflation rate from May remained unchanged at 8.7%, with air travel, recreational and cultural goods helping to keep the figure high. Underwater sounds have been heard and the search continues for a sub that vanished on its way towards the wreck of the Titanic. And a cancelled COVID vaccine contract involving French company Valneva cost taxpayers almost £360 million, according to figures that have been released. Before eight, never mind the Hamden roar, we'll be hearing about the Hamden poor as Scotland battles through a rain delay to overcome Georgia in Euro 2024 qualifying. This summer, you could holiday in the Highlands. It's very much a, a spiritual successor to Snakes on a Plane. It's called Midges in a Motor. <laughs> Head to the coast. Over 3,000 watt have been found in Dalgetty Bay. Esther. Most homes. <laughs> or enjoy a city break. If I wanted to be around Americans all day, guess where I'd be? <laughs> yeah, Edinburgh, right? For more summer holiday ideas, listen to the new series of Scotland's Topical Panel Show with me, Des Clark. Breaking the News begins Friday at 1.30 on BBC Radio Scotland and Sounds. Now the time is 10 to 8, and for the 50,000-odd Scotland fans at Hampden last night, things got off to a flyer. Comes off Dyke, speaks back to McGregor! Oh! The dream start to Groupie continues! Callum McGregor! The fabulous strike which the keeper couldn't keep out! Well, with that goal just six minutes into the crucial match against Georgia... A literal downpour was set, dampener was put on proceedings. Torrential rain over the south side of Glasgow, leaving the surface waterlogged and virtually unplayable. I think it's a bit of a farce, to be honest. I mean, the game started, I didn't see any of the officials coming out and checking the surface at all. We were talking about, even in the, the pre, in the warm-up, sorry, you could see the players splashing every time they put their foot down. And it was still raining heavily, and yet the referee never even paid any attention. Yeah, they're going off. off. Players are going off. Steve Clark's telling everyone to calm down. How long this stoppage will be, we don't know. Well, an army of ground staff and volunteers then spent the next 90 minutes or so attempting to clear water off the pitch after several days' worth of rain fell in the space of just a few hours. Finally, it got back underway, and then this from Scott McTominay. But it might be McTominay's way. It does! Oh! Scott McTominay does it yet again! They are not just leading this group at this point. They are romping to Germany! You can feel Liam's excitement from here still. Swimming to Germany. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so from the farcical to the sublime, Steve Clark's men making it four wins from four on a night to remember for a whole number of different reasons. Well, a couple of those among the Scotland faithful were Craig Conacher and Jen Blackwood from the West of Scotland Tartan Army. Morning to both of you. Thank you so much for getting up early and joining us after that um, display last night. Jen, how was it for you? 
It was the longest night of football in my life. It just seemed to go on forever. Did you think the rain was ever going to stop? The rain actually wasn't on for that long, to be honest. Um, so we thought we'd be all right. And then, of course, they were just about to come back out and it started to rain again. And then we're like, oh, no. So at that point in time, we really weren't sure what was going to happen. So how did you keep yourselves busy then? Uh, to be honest, the DJ was absolutely superb. We had the right tone of music. You know, Why Does It Always Rain On Me came on and that was quite a popular one. And we just carried on dancing and singing and just quite kept our spirits up. It was really quite a phenomenal experience. It felt like all you needed was Cliff Richard to turn up like he usually does at Wimbledon every year. <laughs> not t- that would have added to the, the misery. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say